Okay, great. Howdy. I am Jeffrey Snover, um, Microsoft Technical Fellow, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about where I think we are with PowerShell. Everybody's here for PowerShell, right? <laughs> right on. So here's the interesting thing, right? It's 2018, and PowerShell's never been more important. And I'll just say that that's not in intuitively obvious, right? I mean, we started our journey, what, in 2000 and, was it 2000? We shipped in 2006. But we started our journey, Kenneth, when did we start this? What was it? No, it was definitely 2000, and 2000 or 2001, because I published the internal version of the Monad Manifesto in 2001. So, you know, it's been a while. And so you might say, well, hey, aren't you guys done? Like, what are you doing? And the answer is no. Uh, PowerShell's never been more important. And so the reason why is because, have you heard this phrase, the cloud changes everything? Right, we use that phrase a lot. Turns out I actually don't like that phrase. Um, and the reason why is it's a very us-centered and it's a very technology-centered statement. Uh, instead, I like the phrase that the digital transformation changes everything. And this is great because, one, it's true. And then two is it's very much focused in on you and your business, not me and my technology. And it turns out that this idea of digital transformation is, is you know, automation is absolutely intrinsic to it. Now you can't have digital transformation without automation, and that's why PowerShell is so important. Now, how many people think they understand what digital transformation is? Okay, oh, a couple. How many have heard of digital transformation? Right, everybody. So notice there's a gap between the number of people who have heard it and the number of people who think they really understand it. And it's one of those phrases that I think is, is real, right? It's not just a marketing thing. There's real uh, reality to it, but often it gets expressed in a way that honestly, I, I, I have a hard time grokking it. So I'm gonna explain it to you in the way I understand it, and hopefully that'll help you. And then I'll connect the dots between why this digital, first, it'll be obvious as to why digital transformation is so important. But then I'll connect the dots between that and why PowerShell is so important to digital transformation. <coughs> so there's something I like to call the other Moore's Law, right? So you know about, everybody in the industry knows about Moore's Law, right? Transistors double every tw uh, 12 to 18 months, you know, sort of one of the, the linchpins, foundations of our industry since the beginning. I mean, everything has changed because of that. Well, I believe that there is what I call the other Moore's Law. And I believe that the other Moore's Law is gonna be more important for the next 20 years of our industry than the original Moore's Law. And the other Moore's Law, and the reason it's called other is because it's by Jeffrey Moore, okay? And Jeffrey Moore articulated the following model. He said that every business participates in two types of activities, what he called core activities and what he called context activities. And then for each of those, now, now core, what is core? Core are those things that you want to invest in because those things deliver customer value, they differentiate you from your competitors and allow you to charge a premium, okay? different, you know, deliver customer value, differentiate you from your competitor, and you can charge a premium. You'd see why you want to focus your company on core activities. Context activities is everything else, okay? So you're either differentiating yourself from your competitors or you're not, right? And the point was that for these non, these context activities, you want to just, you know, uh, ignore them. Well, you don't want to ignore them. You don't want to focus in on them. Now there's another interesting axis here, and that is mission critical and then everything else. Mission critical, the definition is if you screw up, you're in big, big, big trouble. You can't screw up. Now notice, and this is not entirely obvious, that mission critical, there's core mission critical, that's sort of obvious, but there's also mission critical context. And this is where people get in trouble. Okay, so let's talk about that. So this is where all the money is, and this is where all the risk is, okay? So why is there risk here? 
there's risk here, and how do you end up here? And, and the answer is that often your company starts off here, has something that's core, and then over time, it no longer becomes core. Okay, it's still mission critical, but it's no longer becomes core. And examples are you have some innovation, you get a large amount of customers, and then over time the market responds. It responds with substitutes, it responds by price pressure, et cetera. So it's still critical to your business, right? You can't screw up, like if all the customers leave, you're dead, but you can no longer charge a premium for it, okay? Now, that's where you risk. Now, often to get here, you incurred a lot of technical debt, you move fast to break things, and so what happens is that people will, in this space, will continue to invest at a time that can no longer charge a premium. And that's where what, what Jeffrey Moore called them, that is the killing field of once great companies. And so you have to manage that, okay? Now, let me, be, let me give a different example, and it, it helps get this area in focus. It's mission critical, but you don't want to spend time and energy on it. Email, okay? How many of you think your company would do just fine if email stopped working for a month? One, okay, that's interesting. Story there. No, most email is absolutely critical to most enterprises, okay? And yet, here's the question. For any business, can they add value to their customers, differentiate themselves from their competitors, and charge a premium because they run email better than somebody else? You think Alaska Airlines can sell more airplane seats because they run exchange better than American Airlines? Absolutely not. It's absolutely mission critical and it does not differentiate themselves at all. So that's an example where what you want to do is you just want to write a check, get value, and focus in on something else. Okay? So the heart of digital transformation is you want to build the things that advance your mission and buy what doesn't. Okay, now let me give you another example. Microsoft. Our core business is software. And so we focus everything on getting and developing, you know, getting great people and developing great software. That's where all the attention is. But we also have receptionists. We have cafeterias. At, in Redmond, we have shuttles. We have no technical fellow of the cafeterias, no vice president of the, of the receptionists, no uh, executive uh, staff member in charge of the shuttle, right? Satya Nadella and his leadership team never get together to discuss what should be on the lunch menu next week, right? It's, it's important stuff, right? We spend a lot of money on these services and we get great services, but we spend no time or energy on them. We write a check and focus in on what advances our mission. So we put all of our energy on advancing our mission, and then we buy everything else. So great. Now you got this digital transformation in focus. Uh, I want to go back and say, hey, I want to focus in on building things that innovate and differentiate, and then buy everything else. How do I do that? You know, you go ask your boss for more people. How many think you can go back and say, hey, I got this digital transformation thing in focus. I just need 100 extra heads, and we're going to take off. Right, nobody. That, that conversation happens exactly zero times. It happens successfully exactly zero times. No, that, that's not going to work. So the only people that can be successful with digital transformation is the people who can create bandwidth out of what they're doing today, and then invest that bandwidth in innovation. Okay, so that sounds pretty simple. I mean, look, two things. You, you know, uh, create bandwidth and invest the bandwidth. How hard can that be? Well, it turns out it's hard, right? It turns out it's hard. It requires courage, and it turns out it's hard. So how do you do it? Well, number one, how do you create bandwidth? Software as a service. That exchange example, right? Instead of running exchange yourself, you should just, where, where, by the way, exchange is just one example. Wherever some company offers something that you're investing time and energy on and they're delivering it as a service, in general, you're better off having them, if they do a good job, deliver that for you. Now, that costs you money, right? Uh, but it frees up your people. 
So if you've got a team managing Exchange, by going and having get an exchange from Microsoft, um, it costs you money, but it frees up those people to f then focus in on something. Number two is lift and shift. Lift and shift is the term where you say, hey, I take vir you know, virtual machines that I'm running in premise on premises and I run them in the cloud. That could be Microsoft's cloud, it could be AWS's cloud, it could be Google's cloud, but some lift and shift. And in general, lift and shift creates bandwidth. And the reason why it creates bandwidth is because, one, somebody else is managing all the infrastructure for you. Number two, these uh, suppliers of the cloud often provide free management tools. Superstar Kenneth Hansen left us and is now working at, at AWS, and he's going to tell you about some of those tools where, you know, again, you just have a VM in AWS or a VM in Azure, and all of a sudden you can click a button and get a set of management tools for free, sometimes at a cost, uh, but it frees up, by just lifting and shifting, it creates uh, bandwidth and frees up people. And then number three, automate, 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 right? The stuff you're doing today, if you can automate that, stop clicking next, take the time, invest, automate things so that they run operationally, you know, just on a schedule or whatever, then that frees up bandwidth. Now, what do you do with that bandwidth? You invest. How do you invest? The answer is you want to don't just go reproduce what you had, you know, the mess you had today. Take the time, pause, learn about these new cloud architectures. Kenneth's going to talk to you about functions or Lambda. We call it functions, he calls it Lambda. Same model, serverless computing. Serverless computing is where you just run the code. I give the code to somebody and they run it based upon events. And you don't care about the operating system, right? They manage the operating system for you. You don't have to patch, et cetera. Uh, the, the cloud provider provides that for you. So there's a bunch, I'm not saying, oh, go do Lambda, go do functions. I'm saying learn the new cloud architectures. One of the points about these cloud architectures is they allow you to focus in on this value you deliver to customers and not the infrastructure required to get all that up and running. Number two is you want to embrace DevOps. I see Steve Murawski here. Presumably you're going to do some talks about DevOps? Uh, sure. Okay. So maybe ignore Steve. But you want to learn DevOps. DevOps really is the modern way you deliver value, deliver software. Um, now, you go to anybody, how many people go to DevOps or focus in on DevOps? Okay, a few. Here's the thing. If you go to a DevOps conference, if you ha didn't raise your hand, I encourage you to participate in it. It's a very important th a model. Uh, I'll say two things. One is they spend a lot of time talking to, to with the among, amongst each other about what DevOps is. Uh, never does that conversation end with people walking away saying, oh, now we have it in focus. Um, <laughs> and I think they spend a little too much time talking about that. To me, DevOps is really only two things. Number one, it is do your work in small batches very, very frequently. Okay. And number two is stop being a jerk to your coworkers. No, really, seriously. Developers stop being a jerk to our operations. Operations stop being a jerk to developers. Work together. Now the details, there's lots of details, but that's it. Do work in small batches. Do it very frequently and stop being a jerk. Now, and then what do you do? You automate, automate, automate. Intrinsic to DevOps, intrinsic to the new world is automation. Now the interesting thing about this is you're automating both places, but you're doing it for different reasons. Here, you're automating so that you can stop focusing in on it, okay? There, you're automating so that you can focus, okay? This says, I automate something, it frees me up so I can go spend time somewhere else. Here, you're automating because what you're doing is you want to go fast, fast, fast. You focus in on the customer and then you want to go, it's all about figuring, getting a customer signal, getting an insight, a customer conversation, some insight from data you've collected and say, hey, I bet you if we did this, customers would be happy. Now you had this insight. How quickly can you deliver that insight to code to the customers and find out whether your insight was right or wrong and then adjust? So it's about being able to go fast, fast, fast. 
the heart is the future digital transformation is all about automation or automation is a critical role in it. So excellence in digital transformation, the people who are excellent in this will win. The people who are not, the people, uh, it's just pretty simple math, right? You got two competitors. One says, hey, I get this digital transformation in focus. I'm going to take, instead of having the bulk of my people focused in on, on um, regular, you know, just keeping the lights on, I'm going to shift to digital transformation and get the bulk of my people focused in on delivering value. And the other company that says, eh, I don't know about this digital transformation. I'll keep doing the way the things I, the way I've been doing them. Over time, one company's going to win and the other company's not. Because if we're just honest, right, if we're just honest with e each other, the bulk of IT in most companies is not spent advancing the business. The bulk of IT is in keeping the lights on. And I will tell you that there is a world of difference between those. When you're working at a company where IT is viewed as just keep the lights on, the conversation is always this. How can we do more with less? Hey, how can I cut your budget? How can I get rid of some of your people? How can I get rid of the senior people and hire junior people so I pay less in, rev in, uh, in costs? Right? Familiar conversations. When it's about, when you work for a company that views IT as a way of making money, it's a completely different world. If I came to you and I said, hey, I've got a mechanism where every time you spend a dollar, you can earn $10. Most people would not say, can I spend 70 cents? And then the next month, or next year, can I spend 50 cents? No. They say, wait, so if I spend a dollar, I earn $10. They're going to say, can I spend $100? Can I spend 1000 Can I spend a million? Can I mortgage my house and get in on this deal? Right? Because every dollar I spend, I get 10 more. So that's the difference between IT as a way of saving money, and by the way, there's only so much money you can save, to IT that helps earn money. Hint, there's no maximal amount of money you can earn. Okay? So excellence at IT at digital transformation is winning, and that means that excellence at automation is winning. So you see, this is why PowerShell is so important, because automation is so critical to advancing your business. So you look at this and you say, well, great. It's just Windows PowerShell, right? The answer is no. Windows PowerShell is all about Windows. However, the world is heterogeneous. Now, a lot of this you'll just say, but Jeffrey, I love, I love PowerShell. I love Windows. That's great. Uh, happy days. But here's the reality. The reality is in this world where you say, I want to focus in on delivering value to the customers and not all the infrastructure, what you will find is it's about code reuse, leveraging other people's code. Okay? A lot of that code is Windows. But a lot of that code is also Linux. So whether you like it or not, you need to be able to manage and leverage a heterogeneous world. Because when you're out there and you say, hey, I need a component that does this, and you find out that, that this already exists and it runs on Linux, you can't say, well, I don't know how to manage Linux. Uh, I'll just build it from scratch. No. You got to manage Linux and you got to manage Windows so that you can get the best components so you can focus in on delivering customer value. And Windows PowerShell is very much focused in on individual machines, right, or collections of machines. How Put your seatbelts on. The AC's on. Wow. We're about to take off. Thank you. That's a little... A little bit better. Uh, Windows PowerShell is focused in on Windows servers. However, automation is often focused in on services. And services are, in many cases, just as important, in some cases, more important than individual machines. And the cloud really needs better programming and large support. So our conclusion was that a new tool was needed. So, 
This is jo Joey Aiello, sad Joey. Uh, so if you recall, when we started PowerShell, we made what was called the sacred vow. The sacred vow basically said, hey, as IT people, I know your hair's on fire, and the last thing in the world you want to do is to learn a new tool. And I'm asking you to stop doing what you're doing and to learn PowerShell. And my sacred vow to you is we're going to make that one of the best investments you ever made. We're going to reuse things, et cetera. So when it came time to do configuration, did we come up with a new configuration language? The answer is no. We leveraged PowerShell and made it desired state configuration. Uh, when we needed to do X, Y, and Z, did we come up with a new language and a new tool? The answer is no. We re-leverage PowerShell, PowerShell, PowerShell. So we have the sacred vow, but I'm telling you I, had, I need a new tool. So how does that square? The answer is yes. It's PowerShell. So basically, we're just eliminating Windows and making PowerShell cross-platform. So we have a new mission. And for that new mission, we have a new tool. And the new tool is, the new mission is to support digital transformation, your digital transformation. And therefore, our new mission is to be able to say, from any client, be able to manage any server running in any cloud, Azure, AWS, Google, or on-premises using any hypervisor, Hyper-V, or VMware, or any networking storage uh, stack. Okay, be able to manage anything from anywhere. So what about Windows PowerShell? Uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1 is effectively complete. Okay, uh, it's fully supported. It's going to be supported forever. Look, I, I mentioned to you I'm a technical fellow, right? So just to get that in focus, Microsoft has about 120,000 employees. Um, so technical fellow, we have, a, we have career tracks. And if you want to get to be CEO, you follow the management career track and you move up there and you get to vice president and et cetera. If you are an individual technical contributor, you go up a career track. The top of that career track is technical fellows. So out of 120,000 employees, we have about 11 individual contributor technical fellows. Okay, so kind of a big deal. As a technical fellow, I spent the, the bulk of my, what, 19 years at Microsoft trying to kill and get rid of and stop shipping command.exe. You'll see command.exe still in Windows, and it ain't ever going away. And why is it never going to go away? Is it, but I've been trying to kill it for the last 19 years. Why is it never going to go away? And the answer is because people use it. So guess what? People are, gonna, people are using and will continue to use Windows PowerShell. It's never going to go away. It'll be supported forever. So, however, there is no new feature development here. Uh, we'll do security fixes when required, et cetera. Um, but that all of our feature uh, focus and investment goes into this new PowerShell. We call it PowerShell Core. Now, I have no trouble with this whatsoever. I will, and I'll tell you why. PowerShell version 1 was about 20 times more powerful than command.exe. And that was PowerShell version 1. And we then added five versions on that. Remoting, desired state configuration, language, visual editors, debugging tools, et cetera. It has, I am absolutely convinced, it has all the capabilities necessary for the next 20 or 30 years, full stop. So I have no problem saying, hey, I'm going to put a code of shellac on that and then focus in on this new tool. Now, there were, shifting over to this new tool, the new mission required some breaking changes. Now, most of these breaking changes were small, uh, but to be a full first class citizen on Linux, there were some changes that were required. And so when we moved to the new tool, we chose a new name. And so it's PWSH, and that's the reason why. Now, the degree of compatibility is, frankly, quite high. I believe that most of you will not notice any of these breaking changes, like ever. However, if you had a script, and it actually did, right? Somebody out there's got a script, and you borrow that script, and you use it, and we had called it PowerShell.exe, it would have created a big problem. And people would say, oh, I don't know whether it's supported or not. So that's why we decided to be clear, hey, there is a, uh, a difference here. Uh, there are some breaking changes, et cetera. So PowerShell Core. 
Uh, PowerShell Core is the future of PowerShell. It's built on .NET Core. It is cross-platform. Uh, runs in whatever environment or operating system makes sense for you. Uh, it is self-contained. And this is, uh, we don't talk about this as much as we should, I think. That is to say, it runs side by side, X-copyable deployed. So I was just in uh, Austin, Texas at Spice World, and, and my laptop, where I had all my demos, um, would not project. Like, found that up right before the talk. The other rooms, it worked. In one room, it did not work. Big crisis. They said, well, just uh, copy your slides to this uh, presentation machine in the room. So well, that, that works for my slides, but I got demos. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? The answer is, because I don't have admin privileges to their machines, PowerShell 6 is X copyable deployable. So I just went to the gallery, copied it, and ran it from there. And it just worked great. So fantastic. So it's side by side, X copyable deployable. Um, and it is open source. Okay. Um, so now, open source. If you ever have any question about how PowerShell does something, you can, you can go look at the source code itself and find out the real answer. So this gives you a direct line to the team uh, and allows you to contribute code as well. And again, our focus in is on managing anything, anywhere. We ship PowerShell Core version 6.0 in January? January. January. We just released PowerShell Core 6.1. Okay, um, this has got incredible uh, coverage, improvement in coverage. Okay, so the point is because it's based upon .NET Core, there's .NET Core and there's .NET Full. They are different. They're compatible largely, but they're different. So it turns out that what you need to do is you need to write your commandlets in a way that work with both. And if they don't, you know, just work in PowerShell version 6. So when we ship PowerShell uh, Core, we shipped with, what, 190-some-odd hundred commandlets. Pretty, pretty weak. We now shipped, uh, we worked with the, the team, worked with the Windows team to get that coverage up. We now have over 1,900 commandlets. So by far, you know, the bulk of the, the coverage is there. Oh, here you go. Here's a great chart. So what this shows, by the way, this is kind of a lousy chart because that <laughs> one to nine and then to 32, that looks like 18 to me, but some of you 32, and then 69. Okay, anyway. So what this, <laughs> this, this was done by our engineers, not our PMs, apparently. <laughs> is that true, Hamad? Joey, doom. <laughs> So what this is showing you was the, the PowerShell journey. When PowerShell shipped, we actually shipped with 128 commandlets version. You know, this is number of months after release. It took us 32 months before we got 400 commandlets, and then 60 some odd months before we got 2,300 commandlets. So it's a pretty long path, right? With PowerShell version six, we shipped. We had oh, I guess we had over 400. Oh, I was wrong. We had over 400. I was I got it wrong. We had over 400, and then nine months later, we've got 1,900. So really, you know, uh, and then <laughs> when, you <laughs> when you add the community commandlets, it goes up even higher. So the critical mass of this is, is going very, very quickly. So one of the great benefits of this is the dot, why did they do this .NET refactoring? It was two answers. One was to have a fresh start and be cross-platform and open source. The other was this fresh start enabled them to really focus in on things like speeds and performance. So .NET uh, 2.0 is very, very fast, and PowerShell has benefited from that. In addition to that, we've had a number of people from the community that are passionate about, about performance, and they have contributed, they have modified PowerShell to make certain components very fast. Well, say that again. The community have people that are passionate about PowerShell. They modified PowerShell and made it very fast, and you're benefiting from their work. So yay to open source. We added <coughs> this PowerShell uh, experimental feature flag. Dongbo did that. By the way, Dongbo, are you giving your talk again? Dongbo has this amazing talk. If you want to know how PowerShell works, 
uh, he has this talk to say, hey, here's how, when you type something in at the pipeline, here's what happens underneath the covers. Amazing talk. Anyway, so he added this experimental flag feature. Now, why is that important? I don't know, experimental flags, who cares? Here's the reason why it cares. Whenever we would go and say, hey, I got an idea, maybe we should do this, that idea was always subject to the following discussion. Okay, is it the right thing to do or not? Because we're, if you ship it, we're going to ship it to what? We're going to ship it to a billion users. So if you screw it up, you're screwing up a billion people. Oh, well, maybe we shouldn't ship that. Yeah, don't ship it unless you know you're not going to screw up a billion people. Okay? So then it turns out that that added you know, a, a heavy dose of conservatism uh, and, and made things go slow. And so what this feature flag, experimental feature flag, allows us to do is to say, hey, let's ship that and hide it behind a feature flag. For those of you that are interested, turn this feature flag on, try it, and let us know what you think. And if there's a sufficient number of people that think it's great, then the next time we ship it, we'll ship it without the feature flag. If it turns out that we screwed up and, oh, yeah, I turned that feature flag on and this isn't good, you just turn the feature flag off and it goes away. So this is really great. We added markdown support. So now markdown files, you can render those in the console and, as I say, built on .NET Core. Now, let's do a demo. So here is PowerShell version 6. Notice the change to black. I actually don't like that change. It's a platform. Um, now, so this is, uh, by the way, so dollar sign PS version table, right? So you see it's 6.1 core running on Windows. And when I say get command, type to measure. By the way, this is the latest October build of Windows 10. And I have 1,845 uh, commandlets. There are more, there's some optional uh, features that have come with commandlet support that I haven't added. Um, but, so that's great, but, but, here's my, my happy blue thing. And when I say get command, get command type to measure, oh, well it has 3,100. So now here's the good news and bad news. The good news is, um, hey, the bulk of the commandlets most of you use are available on core. And really what this does is it represents uh, a, a long tail of things that, oh, on some point, some esoteric time, I might need these commandlets. But most of what you're going to need is available there. Eh, sort of true, sort of, eh, question. Well, what we've developed is a module called the Windows Compatibility Module. And by the way, this is available on the gallery. I didn't show it. It's available on the gallery because it doesn't ship with Windows because we're continuing to work on it. Windows compatibility module. And notice here there's this uh, feature called import win module. So let's think about this. So how do you actually run commandlets, right? So the model underneath the covers is you import a module and then you run the commandlets, right? That's the way it used to be before we had auto modules. Auto load. So notice here, if I say um, get command TLS, notice there's this TLS module that has a bunch of great TLS commandlets. But here, get command star TLS, they're not there. Okay, so by the way, this is what I mean by, yeah, sometimes these things are edge cases. How many people use the TLS commandlets? Oh, okay. You guys don't, so you're fine. You do. Turns out everybody's got their edge case. There's probably some other module where he says he doesn't use it, but you need it, et cetera. So there's edge case. So how do we do this, right? So there's this TLS commandlet, TLS module. So wouldn't it be great if I could just say import module TLS? And the answer is I can't because it's not available here. So all I do is I say, with using the Windows compatibility module, I say import win module TLS. Now I'll say minus verbose. Like what? So now, get command.
in TLS. And notice, I have these commandlets. Okay? That's pretty darn cool. Wait, now how'd that work? Well, notice here, these commandlets are commandlets. But these commandlets are functions. What? So underneath the covers, underneath the covers, notice this module, Windows compatibility, we created a local connection and we did import PS module of those commandlets. And so what they're doing is now everything works, right? Uh, get TLS five dash name, I don't know, whatever. Uh, anyway, so uh, auto command, uh, uh, tab completion works. Um, there it is. You know, all that stuff continues to work. And why? So this is the magic of implicit remoting. So if you think about it, this is, we're doing exactly what we've done with the WMI commandlets, right? So if you're familiar, like get net adapter, right? So how does get net adapter work? And the answer is, it actually is being implemented in WMI, okay? So what we have is we have a little head function that then says, okay, I present the PowerShell commandlet interface, and when they hit carriage return, I talk to another process using a protocol. That other process is called WMI. WMI has a provider model. It calls the net adapter provider, gets that information, transfers it over the protocol, and displays the results. Head, protocol, agent, provider, flows back, produce the results. Here, we're doing exactly the same thing. I got a head, the transport, WinRM, the provider, Windows PowerShell, version 5.1, or the agent, the provider, the TLS module, flows back and get the results. So that's crazy cool, right? So this now gives you full 100% coverage, okay? So check this out, print working directory. C temp, and I say, let's say, what was that? Get command start TLS. New TLS session ticket key minus path ticket one. Something, and I do a dir. There's my ticket one. That's great. Now let's go to some other directory, see temp, and do ticket two. Der ticket. There's my ticket two. Everybody see the see the trick there? So wait a second. So I run this command, it then sends something and created something on the file system. It sent it to another process, right? So so how is it that I was able to change directory in the calling command and have the thing that generates something in the process uh, output it to my current working directory? And the answer is we changed PowerShell to do this. Now PowerShell has a new event saying I'm gonna change my current working directory. The Windows module picks up on that change and goes and communicates to the session to say, what's your current working directory? Here, let me, let me do it differently. I say, dollar sign S equals GSN. This is the channel that I'm communicating, that I'm sending over through everything through. If I say invoke command dollar sign S, um, print working directory, I'm there. If I say CD, C colon Windows, system 30, system, and I do it again, notice it changes. So every time the local thing changes, it changes all the implicit remoting. <laughs> ah, anyway, cool, crazy stuff works very, very well. So Windows compatibility module, awesome, awesome stuff. So one of you will ask the question, great, so when do I switch to this new PowerShell core? And the answer is for you, for most users, depends on when it makes sense, right? Uh, it works side by side, I'd encourage you to try it. The great thing about side-by-side -side is, if it doesn't work, just go do it in PowerShell. By the way, if it doesn't work, use the Windows compatibility module, and if that doesn't work, use it in PowerShell. And some of you might never switch, right? If you're not doing cross-platform, et cetera, uh, you might never switch. If you don't want the new features that we're adding, you might never switch. 
for commandlet providers. If you're writing commandlets, you definitely need to switch and to support both, and there's a well-defined way to do that. And if you're a script writer, we need you to start, or, you know, and you're sharing your scripts or modules, we need you to declare which version you support. So you do that by saying, you know, the, the tag, the PS edition, and you say underbar core to say, I support PowerShell core. So, great stuff. Love it, PowerShell version six, awesome. What's next? You know, what comes in our next version? And the real answer is, I don't know. I literally, I don't know. And the reason I don't know is that over 50% of the contributions for PowerShell version six and PowerShell version 6.1 came from the community. So I can only tell you the things I know that we're doing. I don't know what the community's doing. So what we're investing in, we're now completely transparent about this. On GitHub, we have all the things that we're working on. You can take a look in there and you can comment, say, hey, that's cool, what about this? Uh, when we make changes to the language, we do that completely transparently with RFCs. Now, our investment in PowerShell, here's where we're going to be investing. We're going to invest in cloud and service management. We're going to be investing in better support for programming in the large, and we'll have some amount in community feedback. It will be in this order of priority, okay? <coughs> so cloud and service management. This falls into two categories. One is to make it easy to consume cloud and resources. So this is back to that kind of mission. Hey, I got a bunch of people that want to use Azure, but they're Linux guys. Hey, that's great. If you're on Linux, you should be able to consume a lot of Azure. Happy days. V our buddies at VMware, they had said, hey, this is great, this PowerShell is great, but I got the Linux people and they're sort of pissed off because they're looking at my Windows guys saying, hey, they got a great automation experience, but what about my guys, my Linux guys? And now they can support them. So any user running on any OS should be able to manage your stuff. Manage all the targets. VMware, AWS, Google, Microsoft, we support what? All OSs. We don't say, hey, if you want Windows VMs, come to us. But if you want Linux VMs, go to our competitors. And we don't do that. We say, we want all of yours. Everybody says you want all of it. So you got to be able to manage all of it. Um, we are, we'll find that the protocol that's emerging is REST-based protocols. And so there's a REST protocol, and then there's a way to annotate and describe the REST protocol called Swagger. And we're working on a mechanism to generate first-class commandlets from Swagger directly. Ooh, very cool. Uh, we've been working on this production quality uh, gallery. We were already using a CDN. Again, thanks to great feedback from our VMware partners. They said, hey, you told us to use this gallery. Kind of sucks. Kind of sucks for people in Asia. Kind of sucks for people in Europe. And what are you going to do about that? Thank you very much. Appreciate the kick in the pants. Uh, so we now use the content distribution network. And we've made a number of improvements to our gallery. We will continue to make uh, improvements to make that more production quality. And there is Cloud Shell. Everybody got, everybody has every, who has not used Cloud Shell? Oh, okay. Cloud Shell is this amazing thing. I'm not sure I'm going to demo it. If I don't, we'll talk about it. Uh, it is this amazing thing. You can run PowerShell in the browser. So the thing, I, in that horrible situation in Texas where I couldn't access it, I showed it running PowerShell version 6 on the box. But I wanted to show it also running in Linux. And they, I couldn't install WSL, I couldn't install a, a VM, any of that. So I just brought up a browser, navigated to the Azure portal, clicked a button, brings up PowerShell in a browser, running on Linux, and was able to manage uh, Azure from it. Wonderful stuff. Two things we do around cloud. One, make it easy for you to consume as much cloud stuff as possible. The things we do here will also help you in um, AWS and Google and, and VMware. It helps, you, helps everybody consume everything. That's core mission. The second is more Microsoft focused. We're using PowerShell to drive some of our cloud and service features, right? So all of our update management, our inventory, Azure update management, change inventory, uh, automa Azure automation, configuration management, 
all of the Azure Secure uh, baselines, um, Azure functions, these are all features of Azure that are predicated on PowerShell. Remember I said 2018, PowerShell has been, never been more important. It's critical to Microsoft and Azure as well. Here's an example of the Azure portal. This is a particular virtual machine. And you notice under operations, well, here's automation script, but all these things here, most of the things here are all premised uh, based upon PowerShell, right? PowerShell's at the core of, of most of those things. Now, programming the large. Last few years, I've been focused in on something called Azure Stack. Azure Stack is where we take Azure services or a subset of those and run them on your servers in your data center, okay? This thing is run on PowerShell, full stop. I got over 250,000 lines of PowerShell. I got a lot of PowerShell. It's not the best PowerShell, but I got a lot of it. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of it. It turns out that uh, uh, we've had some challenges uh, in doing this. PowerShell is awesome for you know, single line, it's awesome for simple scripts, it's awesome for medium sized scripts, it's awesome for large scripts. But for very large scripts, once you get into a couple hundred thousand lines of code, all meant to work together, some of the, uh, we begin to run into some challenges. And so, so we're gonna focus in on fixing that. Now here's an example of the Azure Stack internals. Now just to highlight, this is a simplified diagram, okay? No, I'm absolutely serious. This is a dramatically simplified diagram. This thing is one of the most complex things the planet Earth has ever seen, okay? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, no, I mean, we run, we run four servers, four to 16 servers, physical hosts. We have probably 30 to 40 VMs. Within each of those VMs, we have multiple roles. Uh, each one of these roles has multiple, you know, has to be continuously or highly available. So I've got multiple instances of these things. Now think about the following. Okay, I got a gazillion moving parts and I got a Windows update. And I got to update all of this stuff and it's got to keep working. It's one thing to say, okay, hey everybody, <laughs> just go home for a few weeks. So you got to update this thing and come back in time to do it again. No, I got to sequence this thing. Say, okay, I can stop this and then it'll fill over to that, and then I update this, and then I start it, and then I do the next one, and this has to happen before this, or this one has to happen before that. Very complex stuff, okay? Now, um, and we manage the entire life cycle. I mean the entire life cycle, right? So these systems are integrated systems that we co-design with people. We do the deployment, the configuration, the provisioning. We do the validation. We monitor it. We do field replacement of all the parts. We do patch and update. We do business continuity, backup and, and disaster recovery. We do security privacy. I mean, this is a fully, this is an appliance experience, right? This is not, this is not like Windows Server, right? Windows Server, here's your CD-ROM, here's your rabbit's foot, you're gonna need that, best of luck. You got a lot, <laughs> you, you, you got a lot of work in front of you, no. Here, this is a fully integrated system, right? You pick a vendor, you pick a capacity, they roll it up like 24 hours later, people are actually using it. Why? Why does it have that appliance experience? Just like a storage area network is like an appliance, it's because of PowerShell. PowerShell runs the entire thing. Okay, now, <laughs> Azure Stack is programming in the large. So, as I mentioned, um, when we create a virtual machine, by the way, this is not, oh, I got Azure Stack, and then off to the side at the beginning, at the end, I got some PowerShell, and I set it up and I get out of the way. No, PowerShell is intrinsic to the production quality of this thing. When you create a new VM, there's an on average 472 calls to commandlets to create a VM, okay? PowerShell is intrinsic, GIA is absolutely intrinsic to the the security design of PowerShell, of Azure Stack, and we have an awesome security design. Okay, so I wanna give you a little history here. So originally we had something called Cloud Platform Solution. That was sort of an early version of what became Azure Stack. We uh, went to the team and said, hey, you wrote the, all the deployment stuff in PowerShell, now I need you to move to desired state configuration. 
and the team said, I hate PowerShell. I don't want to do it in PowerShell. I want to reiterate it in C Sharp. It's like, really? That's never going to work. Uh, but why? Like, so let's talk. What do you hate about PowerShell? And what they said was, look, you have not, these are developers, professional developers, and you're not giving me what it takes to succeed, right? So concretely, hey, we use Visual Studio Code, and ISC is very nice, but it's not Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code gives me integration with my source code control system. It's the tool I use. It's the thing I put on my resume. And so in PowerShell, Windows PowerShell version 5, we supported Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Then, by the way, this is all an explanation for why you saw the features that we, huge changes we made in PowerShell version 5. Then they said, hey, I, I, I call scripts from all these other teams, and they have to fulfill a contract. And a script signature is not a very good contract to have people implement. We do contracts in classes. It's like, oh, that's right. That makes sense. So that's why we add class support, right? Classes and when we did classes, we added the new language support because they said, hey, this thing about dynamic scoping, like what the heck's that? That makes no sense. And so in the classes language mode, we support lexical scoping, which is the scoping most programmers develop. And I actually prefer it. We added, they said, hey, actually, this is a funny story. The development manager one day, I was out getting coffee, and I thought the guy was going to punch me in the face. I mean, he was really just that upset with me. So I said, well, you and your freaking PowerShell. He said, what are you talking about? He said, you cost me three days. I said, I cost you three days? I'm pretty sure I didn't cost you three days. What are you talking about? He says, well, one of my developers wrote a script, and he wrote a bad script, and it took us three days before we fixed that, found it, and then fixed it. Why isn't there something that, like a lint tool, that can catch that stuff before they check it in? I said, you know what, that's a pretty good idea. So we now have the script analyzer. And then, hey, how do I unit test this stuff? There's no unit test framework. And so we invented Tester. And so really, this was start of our journey to, yep, hey, this is a great environment for admins, but in terms of programming large, more work needs to be done. I will tell you that I mentioned this is a pretty complex system. So we do need more, and I've said, we're delivering this as an appliance experience. Appliance experience means it's not I give you a whole slew of s stuff and you gotta figure it out. We are delivering an experience like driving a car, right? You drive a car, a light comes on, says put oil in. A drive a car, a light comes in, puts gas in. That's the experience that we're delivering with, with Azure Stack. You use it, a light comes on, says replace this disk. A light comes on, says reboot this server. Okay? That hyper complexity is what we use to deliver to you hyper simplicity. And guess what? That's your goal as well. You want to do the same thing we're doing here, which is to say, take all that complexity and turn it into simplicity for your users using automation. Okay. So our challenge is, right now, uh, there is a, uh, I think, a kind of core design flaw we had in the ver early version of PowerShell, where some commandlets throw terminating errors and some commandlets don't. And the challenge is that you don't know which does which. And the way you handle the error is different one from the other. So that's a real problem. And so we want something that's like this ubiquitous on PS error uh, switch on all commandlets. And the idea would be it takes a script block, and if it was a terminating error, you just call this thing once. But if it was a non-terminating error, you call that script block for every non-terminating error. And that would dramatically simplify our code, and in particular, give us higher quality, because sometimes I've had developers think, oh, this thing throws a terminating error, when in fact it called a non-terminating error, he wrote the wrong code. We need better control over scopes, uh, you know, what things get, um, exposed and hidden when you have nested modules. <laughs> Everyone will appreciate this. Want to be able to set a breakpoint when something fails. Right now, you know, and, and, and basically break it at the point where you have the full call stack and all the information necessary to debug something. Right now we give you control after all that, after we throw away all the necessary information for you to debug the problem. <laughs> Not so good. Five minutes and other stuff. <laughs> so I mentioned to you that uh, uh, 
it's about digital transformation and how automation is it, it critical to digital transformation. It's 2018, and hopefully you see why PowerShell has never been more important. Never been more important, never been more vital, never more important to continue moving forward. But again, that's kind of a technology focus. The reality is PowerShell is just a technology. It requires you to take that technology and allow you to transform your business with that. So it's 2018 and you have never been more important because you're using PowerShell to transform your companies. So I mentioned to you what comes next. I don't know, 50% of the things that have come into PowerShell came from the community. I expect that's gonna be more so in the future, or more so at least in 6.2, because we have a lot of engineering debt that needs to get uh, uh, taken care of. So we're gonna be focusing in on things that allow us to move faster, our in internal engineering systems. So we've got some amount of budget to be able to add features, but not, not as much as uh, other times. So we expect the community is gonna be picking up and de delivering a lot of features function. So really this is a time, right? PowerShell is now shifted. It's no longer the Microsoft PowerShell team. Now it is our tool. It is your tool, it is my tool. Not I develop it, you run it, we develop it, we run it, okay? So um, this is a time you and the community should lean in you should reach out, help one another. The community is incredibly powerful. You know, when you're sitting there struggling, don't struggle, don't suffer in silence. Reach out to the community. Hey, I'm having this problem. Does anybody else have that problem? Often you'll get an answer. Often you'll get a pointer to somebody who has an answer. When you help someone in that environment, you incur a debt of gratitude. You come to a conference like this, see that person that helped you, they'll buy you coffee, maybe they'll buy you a beer. Right, so it's a, it really helps each other. You wanna build stuff and then publish your stuff. Don't take your stuff and keep it to yourself. Publish it on the gallery. A lot of people say, oh, it's not that good, et cetera. Publish it anyway. Often, it isn't as good as you'd like it to be. Often, other people will come, and this has happened to me. I publish stuff and people said, why did you do it that way? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, why didn't you do it this way? It's like, oh, that's cool, I didn't know you could do that. So publish. Uh, you help other people, and they, in turn, will help you. Okay, now my prediction. I believe PowerShell Core will get renamed to PowerShell. PowerShell Core sounds like a qualifier. It is not a qualifier. It is the thing. So I predict we're going to probably change that name. We have this new module called Ships. Is anybody talking about Ships here? Ooh, that's an error. Wait, Robbie, are you talking about Ships? Oh man, <laughs> Ravi just, uh, anyway, so there's always been this long debate. Hey, do I do commandlets or do I do namespaces? And the answer was, commandlets are pretty easy to write, namespaces, super, super hard to write. The namespaces are the things like, you know, the file system or the uh, registry drives. We now have made uh, this new module that makes it very easy to write your own namespaces. Ravi wrote these incredible namespaces, uh, PSConf EU. You could CD into the conference and do a dir and see which days and CD into a day and do a dir and see the talks and the speakers. Just crazy interesting stuff. So I think that that ships is gonna reinvigorate namespaces and you'll see a lot more namespaces. By the way, that's what we use when you see, when you go into the cloud drive and you're landed in the Azure module and you do a dir and you see all your subscriptions, we're using the ships module to do that. Excellent. So she's going to demo that in the Cloud Shell talk later. Oh, the two of them will. Uh, Swagger-based commandlets, I'm very bullish on this. I think they're going to do very well, very optimistic about this. Ah, I used to say that uh, Cloud Shell was going to ship as Linux only, and yep, and uh, turns out uh, we already did that. <laughs> so that was a prediction I had made earlier, and it came true. And by the way, a lot of people are like, what? You Cloud Shell, it's Linux only? What's the point there? And the point is, in Cloud Shell, you don't manage, and it runs a Linux container. You're not, you, you're not managing that, that operating system. You're using that operating system to manage remote operating systems and remote services. So it doesn't really matter what operating system it is. 
okay, so if it doesn't matter, why did you want, why did you use Linux? And the answer is, we support your choice of Bash or PowerShell. And when we had two different operating systems, we want to provide not just Bash and PowerShell, but the set of tools. And it turned out that Terraform was different on Linux than on Windows, and Windows was a little behind. And then here we had Vim, and here we had VI, and one had Emacs, but the other one didn't. It's like, ah, this is just going to be a mess. So we got one environment, and we had two different teams, and one team was ready, and the other team would say, hey, wait two days because I'm not quite ready. This is just a mess. So now we got one environment. The key observation was use this environment to manage other things. So that's why it's Linux only. You got a consistent set of tools. We update that all the time. It always has the latest and greatest tools for you. You do not have to worry about that. Um, what does it say? Ah, so we have this, uh, I believe that we're going to open source and have this model of a hierarchical uh, desired state configuration, local configuration manager. Basically, I've been super hardcore about there'd only be one DSC. And then Kenneth came to me one day and he says, I've solved the problem. I said, I don't think so. Show me. And he got on the whiteboard and he solved all the problems. He says, here's the, how you partition everything. It's like, that was brilliant. Friggin' brilliant. Really good job, Kenneth. Anyway, so we're going to be, now it's, it's going to take us a while, but we will finally ship that. Where you start off, the core desired state configuration will be native code. In fact, we have that today. You don't have it. I have it. Um, <laughs> we're, it is the thing that all of, is securing all of Azure. All the Azure hosts, all the Azure VMs are using that for secu security configurations. And then what you'll see is that'll nest, and there'll be one that works with core, and then one with full. And we've even talked about one that could run in, in uh, an application as a library for very fast updates. Uh, well, again, I had predicted that Linux distributions will uh, start to include PowerShell. Now within Ubuntu, uh, you can just say, hey, uh, install PowerShell uh, as part of the installation. So happy days there. Um, I also believe that in the development world, there's this idea of a full stack developer. A full stack developer is somebody that can work in the front end, the mid tier, or the back end, and they're valuable because you can be agile. I believe that the same a functional equivalent will happen in IT, where you'll have the cross-stack IT person. That instead of saying, here's my Windows team, here's my Linux team, and then, oh, well, I've decided to do more, more Windows, so i got to lay some of you off and then hire, go find some more Windows people to do. Oh, no, I decided to do the opposite. i got to fire those people and hire. No, you'll have people who manage systems. People who manage systems. They can manage Windows or they can manage Linux. And guess what? Those people are far more valuable than people who can only manage single systems. So you want to invest in that. Your careers will benefit for doing so. And at some point, uh, I expect that the community will go and take v6 and run it on full.net. We're not going to invest in that, uh, but I expect that at some point the community will agree to that as well. And with that, actually, I don't think we have time for questions, but I'm going to be around. And so. Thank you.